But when the Son of Man comes in all his glory and all the angels with him, and he will sit on his glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered before them, and he will separate them as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom that was prepared at the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when, when did we see you hungry and give you something to eat? When did we see you thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you naked and clothe you or sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer and say to them, truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even to the least of these, you did it to me. And he will say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which was prepared for the demons and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was naked. You didn't clothe me. I was sick. I was in prison, and you didn't visit me. And they themselves will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or naked? When did we see you sick or in prison and not take care of you? And then he will answer them, truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. It was 2016. I had the privilege of leading a mission trip from a group of people from Joburg into Eswatini. But it was during the drought. We had had months and months and months without rain. The young man that I was hosting this team with, he was visiting Eswatini every week and the conditions became worse and worse. The riverbeds did not have one single drop of water in them. They were parched, they were dry, they were cracked. So we prayed. Our team gathered together. We knew, Lord Jesus, we needed to pray. Lord, open the floodgates of heaven and rain down upon this desperate land. And I can't say that it was our prayers that day. But I can't say that it wasn't. But that very night, the floodgates opened. And it rained. And it rained, and it rained, and it rained. And for 36 hours straight, it rained on that dry, dry land. And of course, that made the work we would be doing that week, very messy. We were doing home visits. And on the second morning of the rain, we were ready to depart, and I prayed. Normally, a prayer I often pray before it's time to go on home visits is, Lord, 
Help me be your hands and feet today. Lord Jesus, give me your heart. Give me your eyes to see how you want me to see. Let me be Jesus. But that morning I prayed something very different. I said, Jesus, I want to meet with you today. I want to see you today. And as we headed out on those home visits, that dry, dusty road that we had walked on two days prior was now red, mud, clay, and it was sticky on our feet. And as we approached the home of the Gogo that we were about to, to visit, we saw her tin shack. It was just a one-room shack. And she must have heard us because she came out to greet us. And as she walked to her little gate and took that little makeshift hook off of the stick that held her gate in place, she looked up and she burst into tears. And I was just a couple feet behind the first group of, pe of people and I thought, oh my word, what did they say to her? What did they do? What did they do? And as we caught up and we got to her, she just was weeping. And in an effort probably to make ourselves feel better, one of the team members took out a tissue and handed it to Gogo. And she began to wipe the tears from her face. She invited us into her homestead, and we sat next to her tin shack, with our back to the shack, the little overhang just right over us. And we wanted to know, why is Gogo crying? And as she shared with us about her 10 children, she proceeded to tell us that not one of them is still alive. And as she cried and told us the story, she said when she walked out of that gate and looked up, she saw one on our team that looked so much like one of her beautiful daughters that's no longer alive. And she just burst into tears. And as she told the story, you can imagine the tears that would stream down a mother's face as she's remembering her 10 children, none of which are still alive. And as I had the privilege of sitting right next to Gogo, she looked down and she saw my filthy feet. And she took her finger and she started to wipe away that red clay. And I said, no, Gogo, it's fine, don't worry. I was almost embarrassed. I thought, well, I'm just surely going to get muddy again. And in the most beautiful act of humility, forgetting the pain which was just drudged up, she took this tear-soaked tissue and she proceeded to wipe between my sandal straps. And then I remembered my prayer that morning. Jesus, I want to see you. I want to meet you today. Fast forward to just a few weeks ago. We brought some friends, and they were visiting from America and from Poland, and we went to another home in a different community. We went to go visit a mom of a young girl who's now coming to one of our centers. And as we started to approach her home, she saw people coming to visit. And she quickly brought out bricks, crates, water jugs that we could sit on. The neighbor knew that this was something special. She even came and brought this little wooden bench for the visitors to sit on. And as we sat and 
just ask that mom, how is life, how are things in your home? She said everything was good. And she was so happy to have visitors. And as we continued to talk and to share, again, she said she was so happy to have visitors. And it struck me in such a way, I thought, I've got to get to what are you, what is, what's behind those words that she's saying? Why is she so happy to have visitors? And so I asked her, Maria, what is it about visitors that's making you happy? She said, when people come to visit me, it makes me feel like a person. And she couldn't remember the last time she had visitors. I remember when I was visited. It was April 1996. I was in my car. I was driving. It was nighttime. It was dark. I don't remember any other cars on the road. And as I was driving, thoughts started swirling in my head. And I started to remember some really dumb decisions I had made a few months prior. And then the heaviness of guilt and shame started to enter my mind. I felt this dark cloud over me, the heaviness of my sin. And that's when Jesus ripped into my car and visited me. He said, Brenda, that guilt is not for you to carry. That shame is not for you. He says, give it to me. Lay it at the foot of my cross. And as he said that, I just felt the weight of that sin just lifted from me. I felt the dirtiness, the darkness of that shame just be washed away. I felt it almost physically. So I took the visor down, and there's a mirror with a little light, and I could see these black tears pouring down my face. And I knew at that moment I was washed clean. My sin was no longer mine to carry. I gave it to my Savior. Some 2,000 years ago, Jesus ripped out of his beautiful, comfortable throne room in heaven, and he came down to earth to visit each and every one of us. He came to each of us and said, my child, that burden, that sin is not for you to carry. Give it to me. And he wiped the heaviness of that sin away for each and every one of us when he died there on the cross for us. Jesus visited each and every one of us. And it's because of that visit that we visit the least of these. So twice a year we get a, a Sunday that's dedicated and devoted to Sinani, which is our regional ministry that reaches uh, the lost in underprivileged communities, and it's our attempt then to tell you what goes on each and every day with our team. And Brenda's launched us beautifully on the path that reminds us to not just go to church, but to be the church. And why should we be the church? Because God's grace on our lives commands a response. 
God sent his son to save us and to rescue us from danger. And he did this by his grace, which is the unmerited favor for sinful humanity. And another way to say it is we were visited by undeserved grace. And one of the most difficult things I think Brenda and I try to do is to translate our God encounters so people are prompted to action, prompted to help, to partner, to go, or to give. And why this is difficult is because you can never fully describe what God does in your own heart. And really what this is all about, it it boils down to our heart's position. If you can turn to Isaiah 45, verse 3, I'll use the NASB. And for the few that still use a paper Bible, I'll wait for just a second. I can hear pages. Some of you still do. It says, I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden wealth of secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name. In the NIV, it says, I will give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord. This verse speaks to what we try to communicate. The result of what happens in ministry, in willingness. It's what happens when you go and visit an elderly person who is lonely. It's what happens when you willingly sacrifice and give something to someone. It's when you come out with Sinani. It's when you had the courage to invite somebody to Alpha. And just aside, anyone that's been involved in Alpha, can I just show a raise, raise your hand if you've been involved in any way? Have you enjoyed it? Of course you did, because you're doing what God wants you to do. And so my point is, it doesn't have to stop with Alpha. In those places, God will give you those hidden treasures. And I have an example of someone who had a willing heart, and his name was Abraham. And I want to preface this, that um, some of you know Sinet, she's on the worship team. She sent a clip by a a pastor named John Bevere, and it was on the WhatsApp uh, worship group. And I don't click on them all the time, but I decided to click on this one, and it was about worship. And there were a few things that really stuck out to me. In his message, he referred to the story of Abraham and Isaac. Some of you will be familiar with it, but if you could turn to Genesis 22, 1 through 5. It says, Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham got up early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he split wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Then Abraham said to his young man, stay here with the donkey, And I and the boy will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. Did you notice what Abraham said there? He said, and we will worship. You know, this is the very first time that worship was ever mentioned in the Bible. And worship wasn't a song. It was an act of obedience to God. And a way to describe worship based on this passage is a life of obedience. You see, we can worship God in how we live and in what we do. God asked Abraham to do the unthinkable. Can you imagine traveling for three days with your son whom you love, thinking about what he's asked you to do? Abraham's obedience to God wasn't a suggestion. He didn't act when it was convenient for him. And what was the result of Abraham's obedience? 
Just as Abraham was going to sacrifice his only son, it says. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there was in the thicket, there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by his horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashores. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all nations of the earth will be blessed, because you have obeyed me. In this passage, notice Abraham said to his servants, we will worship and return to you. I believe Abraham acted in obedience because he knew God's character. He knew somehow, some way, God was not going to do what he asked him to do, or somehow, some way, his son would be spared. This passage shows that yielding to God's will resulted in provision and enormous blessing. What does your worship look like? Are we willing and obedient to extend the grace we've been given? What might the Lord do in your life because you have obeyed him? Are you ready to climb some mountains for the Lord? I know of some mountains where there are hidden treasures waiting for you. And the Lord says you're invited. I mentioned earlier it's about our heart's position. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 through 9, Paul is talking and encouraging and challenging the church in Corinth to follow through on their commitment to the assistance of the poor in Jerusalem. Paul was taking a collection while on his missionary journey, and he tells the Corinthians about the Macedonian churches. In 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 5, should be on the screen, it says, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people. This was sacrificial giving. You guys, they were dirt poor, but God gave them grace beyond understanding. They gave out of their dedication to Christ, their love for fellow believers, and the joy of helping, and because it was just the right thing to do. You see, I've come to the realization that telling people Sanani's working in many communities and feeding 6,000 meals per week is the wrong message. The real message of Sanani is 2 Corinthians verse 8 and 9. It says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. We know the man that gave up everything for you and I, so that we could have heavenly wealth, so that we might become rich in a way that is not of this earth. So Sanani 
is simply access to allow grace to flow to introduce people to Jesus. It should be because we know the grace given to us. And as much as I've, qu- as I've quoted in the past, James 1.27 and the Great Commission in Matthew 28, those are the actions that follow a transformed heart. Sanani is actually a saving grace ministry. When you really, really digest, settle, or somewhat understand the grace that's been given to you, it's almost impossible not to respond to it. And generosity allows for this to take place, to access the heart of lost people. When we say support an orphan for 200 rand per month, we're missing the point. The main point is saving souls and pointing people to Jesus by our words and our actions. Jesus came to save us so that we can open the door for others. This is when we experience the hidden treasures, when our willing hearts show up for God appointments that have been pre-scheduled for us. How many of these pre-scheduled appointments have we made apologies for in the past? Guys, there's an intimacy with the Lord waiting for you that I, I can't properly explain, that I yearn for you to experience for yourself, and that people from the, around the world come here to experience. You see, it's, I consider myself South African, so when I say this, hear me, it's sometimes painful to me when internationals come and are willingly sacrificing their time, their talent and resources to experience what God is doing in our backyard. Many of them give up holidays. A lot of them have to raise funds to come. I want to show you a clip from a few months ago so you can see what I'm talking about. When our mission statement comes out of the Great Commission to help people find and follow Jesus here and around the world, and I'm super honored that we have uh, one of our mission partners with us, Craig and Brenda Rebro. They're from uh, South Africa, and we have been partnering with them for a while, and they're here in the room. Would you guys welcome them today? So glad you're here. If you remember, uh, during Christmas, we had a special giving opportunity, and part of our, our Christmas offering went to help uh, drill a well in Makoko, South Africa, where there is no clean water. And through your investment as a church, they just found water recently, and now it's been provided for the people there. We're, we're sending a team uh, to, to South Africa here in September, incredible missions team that, that they're preparing and praying and super excited about that. But not only that, we're partnering with them uh, to plant a church in that area uh, to, to be able to reach people for Jesus. And one of those leaders named Leif, I have a picture of him who's actually going through Bible college right now through our support. He's a deacon in his church uh, in the Oakley area, which is a church plant. He's pouring into the next generation of teenagers and developing himself uh, for God to use in a greater way. And I'm, I'm just super excited that not only are we meeting physical needs, but we're meeting spiritual needs through a life-giving church for the glory of God. All right, this is what we're called to do. So guys, w- am I on? Okay. It sounds like, there we go. We're part of something bigger. God's on the move in this area. When, when people from 9,000 miles away know about Mokoko, <laughs> Granite Hill, Bushbuck Ridge area, God's doing something here, and I, I want you to hear my heart. I don't want you to miss it. You're invited. But here's the truth. <laughs> Only a small percentage of CU participates in Sanani. And can I have your permission to speak plainly? Anyone going to give me a Yes. I'm going to do it anyway. Out of all seven CU sites, we only have 70 monthly commitments supporting Sanani. You can do the math. That includes Nelsprite. And this isn't to guilt anyone. This is simply the truth. Guys, my aim today is to stir your hearts towards intimacy with God so you can be used to advance the kingdom. Paul was challenging the church in Corinth when comparing them to the churches in Macedonia. 
And here's what he said. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what does grace look like? What you've done for the least of these, you've done for me. This morning, as Craig shared as well, our intention is not to try and guilt you into making a financial commitment. But folks, we want to point you to where God is at work and say, come invest in this with us. Sinani and Church Unlimited Yes, they're registered as separate organizations because they're benefits to doing it that way. But Senani is as much part of CU as anything else we've been doing as a church together. Our role, our call as a church is to go out and to, to seek, seek and save the lost. Senani goes out and saves lives and souls. There's a physical provision which has saved lives, and there is a spiritual pr provision which is saving eternal lives out in the community. And folks, this is where God is moving. If you want to be part of what God is doing, come and plug in, whether it's financially, with money, whether it's time, whether it's resources, whether it's prayer, come and plug into what Sinani is doing to be part of where God is going. So we're laying this morning as elders, we're laying God's heart out in front of you and saying, showing you this is God's heart for the community. How you respond is up to you. But my encouragement is going to be, folks, search your hearts. Search your hearts and see what God is telling you because at the end of the day, our reality is everything we have is by God's grace. And so when he comes and says to you, well, I want you to risk something for me. Are we going to say, no, Lord, you've given me enough just for me. It's not enough for somebody else. Or are you going to stretch yourself and say, yes, Lord, I'll be, I'll be obedient 
and go and do this thing. It's not a call for you to now start tithing, taking your tithe and giving it to Sunani. What we're asking is over and above that, search your heart. Is there a way you can give generously to this work in whatever way, shape or form it may take? We're going to close in a song. And when we're done, as I said, we'll, we'll gather to pray with Morna as he goes. But folks, open your heart to God's guidance this morning. Hear him this morning. Hear what he has to say to you. And if you want to find out more, there is a table on the way out. Go and chat to somebody there. Find out how you can get involved and plug into this work that he's doing. So we thank you, folks. Will you stand with me? And let's, let's close focusing on Jesus.